It all started with a video. I decided to see how quickly you can assess whether a martial art is trustworthy or questionable regarding what they promise versus what they deliver. For my analysis, I chose Bujinkan, an organization which allegedly teaches nine classical combat systems, of which three are ninjutsu and six are samurai-based practices. I have to admit, the video I've made is not my best one. Many people criticized it for using Wikipedia, various Bujinkan websites and YouTube videos as reference points. I agree, I could have done better. But many of the points I've made in the video I believe to be valid. I was questioning the taught techniques and training methodology of Bujinkan schools alongside with some of them claiming to teach effective self-defense, a point I expressed strong doubts about. I received countless messages and comments saying that I've got it all wrong. So I decided to give Bujinkan another shot and gave a challenge to its practitioners. I asked them to send me footage of them pressure testing their techniques and proving their effectiveness, hoping that the footage I will receive will change my mind. After all, I posed the same challenge to Ving Chun and Aikido practitioners and received some great contributions that made me reconsider my prior opinions. Emails from Bujinkan practitioners started pouring in. I kept collecting them until one day I was ready to investigate them all. I sat down expecting to go through countless videos. As I looked through all of the emails, I realized I've got two video contributions. All the other emails were text only, either agreeing with my opinions or again telling me that I am wrong. Needless to say, I wasn't inspired. After my initial Bujinkan video, I also saw a number of YouTube videos that were a direct response to what I published. I was expecting to see some pressure testing videos that would prove me wrong. Instead, these videos were yet again explaining why I am wrong. Now that is not to say that they had no good counter arguments to offer at all. In fact, with one of the video response creators, I will be having a live discussion to see who is right. But when looking at the video responses, I realized something. Imagine I release a video of myself jumping on the spot and then saying that I could jump over a spiked fence. Then someone would release a response video telling me that I am wrong and that I wouldn't be able to do it. What do you think I would do then? Would I release another video of myself jumping over a spiked fence because I can really do it? Or would I release a video explaining for 10 minutes that I could jump over a spiked fence and that the critical video is wrong? If I would jump over the spiked fence to prove my claim, it wouldn't even have to be a spiked fence. I could even jump over a fence with plastic spikes to show my capabilities without taking unnecessary risks. Yet now imagine I would film a video where I would say that I am able to jump off a 10-story building without hurting myself. Then someone makes a video saying I couldn't do it. What do you think I would do then? Film a video of myself jumping off a 10-story building? Or would I more likely film a video where I would talk for 10 minutes explaining that I could do it and telling that the video that says I can't is wrong? My point is, if whatever you're claiming is true, it shouldn't be that difficult to show and prove it in action. It could be even done in controlled environment with safety measures in order to decrease unnecessary risks. But when most of the responses I get are elaborate explanations of why I am wrong without any video evidence to back it up, isn't it natural that it raises suspicion? Now, yet again, some Bujinkan practitioners could say that their techniques are too dangerous to pressure test. And I did reassess my opinion here to some degree. In my initial Bujinkan video, I made a point that if a deadly technique would be effective, we would see some iteration of it in combat sports. George, in his response video on his channel What Would Ninjas Do, made a good point countering my argument by saying that such moves, as for example headbutts or kicking the knee, are in fact illegal in MMA. They could indeed cause serious damage and are difficult to pressure test or train in combat sports. To a degree, I agree with this statement, although I will still get back to this point later in the video. But there are also a lot of other techniques in Bujinkan, such as strikes, kicks and throws, that could be pressure tested and used against live resisting opponents with minimal danger. Yet for some reason, videos of Bujinkan practitioners doing it seems to be very rare. But let's not get ahead of ourselves and take a look at some of the video contributions I received and what we can learn from them. The very first contribution I received was from Samuel Zavaleta, the owner of Cedar Park Dojo. As Samuel explained in his email, in this video of himself sparring against a Hima practitioner, he uses a stance and a thrusting technique he learned in Bujinkan. To be honest, I wasn't sure what to think of it after seeing this video. I guess this is proof that some techniques learned in Bujinkan can be applied in live weapon sparring. 
Although the following natural question arised, would the technique have been successfully applied without having trained in HEMA, which is famous for live pressure testing? As I continued to explore this question, I asked for additional opinions on Reddit. Here, I was grateful to receive another video, an excerpt from a documentary called Human Weapon. In it, host Bill Duff, former NFL player, did a weapon sparring session with a 13th black belt degree Bujinkan practitioner. Bill appears to have a brown belt in Tang Soo Do and he used to do wrestling. Tang Soo Do does have some weapons training, but from what I gathered, it's only a secondary practice, so it would be fair to consider that Bill's weapons training experience was limited. Yet in this weapons sparring session, Bill managed to defeat the high-level Bujinkan black belt by winning two rounds out of three. In the process, the Bujinkan black belt also used a clear opening moment to directly strike Bill's face, leading to a minor injury to his eye. Watching this video, it made me question. If a high-level Bujinkan practitioner loses in his own practice against a much less experienced practitioner and also fails to display the ability to hold back, a skill usually possessed by experienced fighters, what does this potentially speak of the training that this Bujinkan practitioner went through? Now, one point that some people could say is that Bujinkan didn't fail in this example. The practitioner who took part did that it's the practitioner's fault and not the practices. But shouldn't the practice and school also take responsibility? After all, this practitioner was awarded a 13th degree black belt. Shouldn't this level of acknowledgement come with a high level of provable abilities? This also reminded me of a comment I heard on many occasions. It's that Bujinkan lacks quality control. As many people expressed it to me, the Bujinkan organization apparently does not have universal standards of quality. This then leads to varying degrees of quality of practice in schools, with some schools being terrible at what they teach and some schools doing a good job. This is another point that we will come back to. As I continued my search for videos of Bujinkan techniques being pressure tested, I asked my audience if they could send me more links to examine. As usual, some of the contributions weren't that great. While the following practitioner did not present these videos to me as pressure testing videos, he sent them to me as worthwhile checking out videos and asked for my opinion. Unfortunately, what I saw here was what I was already used to seeing in the majority of footage from Bujinkan. Cooperative attackers that would throw a pre-designated attack and would stop to wait for the defender to make his moves. In another video, the attacks were not pre-designated, but the other problem still occurred. After executing a single or couple attacks, the attacker would then stop and wait for the techniques to be performed on him. That is not to say that this type of training offers no merit. Even functional combat sports start by introducing a technique against an attacker who makes a move and then waits. But the difference between the two is that in functional combat sports and martial arts, the following step of live resistance is then added, which changes the dynamics of the training significantly and teaches the defender skills which are necessary to learn for dealing with someone who is intent on causing real damage. This made me think. Usually, when we assess a martial art, we generally tend to focus on the techniques. We ask ourselves, would this move work against a real attacker? And this question does have value. But the more important question I realized is if this move is trained in a way that will teach the person to use it against a real attacker. The process of testing if a technique is applicable against a spontaneously resisting opponent is generally called pressure testing. Without the element of pressure testing or live drilling, it is not only difficult to assess if a technique would work against a spontaneously resisting opponent, it is also very difficult, if not impossible, to learn the necessary attributes required to apply the technique against an attacker who is seriously meant to cause real damage, such as timing and adapting. In other words, a technique itself can be based on solid ideas and concepts, but without live drilling or pressure testing, it's questionable if the effectiveness of the technique would live up to its potential. An example I like to give here is that of Tai Bo, a fitness practice that incorporates Taekwondo and boxing techniques, but has no training with partners, yet alone pressure testing or live drilling. I realize that here, we are treading on hypothetical land, but let's be honest, do you think that someone who practices Tai Bo would do a good job in their first boxing sparring? To say the least, without direct sparring experience, there would be no getting used to, to the essential experience of getting punched in the face. Something I can tell from experience takes time to get used to and is extremely valuable when faced with real danger. The same applies to getting used to the experience of being pushed, shoved, and grappled with in chaotic and unpredictable ways. While Tai Bo may draw inspiration from tested and proving boxing techniques, it could be said that without pressure testing and live drilling, these techniques have little value to offer, especially in the context 
context of applying them in a fighting scenario. Looking at this example as reference, why would we then take possibly effective techniques, train them without pressure or light drilling, and expect them to work under pressure when push comes to shove? My point is, some of the techniques trained in Bujinkan could be inherently effective, but trained without pressure testing or a live drilling, they would likely offer little functionality and value in a fighting scenario. Also, without pressure testing, it is difficult to tell which techniques are functional and which aren't. This way, ineffective techniques can slip by and be passed on from generation to generation. For example, in the video here, a Bujinkan practitioner shows a technique that he suggests to use against a haymaker. During this technique, after striking his opponent back, the practitioner continues to dive under the opponent's arm, eventually adding an additional strike. This technique looks fine and well against a non-resisting opponent, but I have serious doubts if it would pan out this way and work against someone who would offer live resistance. And I'm not speaking just hypothetically here. I personally pressure tested a very similar technique I trained for years in Aikido, called Kaitanage, and had no success in applying it. And here's where the problem lies. Even if some Bujinkan taught techniques have the potential to be functional, if not pressure tested, they most likely won't prove to be functional. And without pressure testing, techniques which are not functional may also bleed into the curriculum. The same can be arguably also said about the other aspects of Bujinkan training that does not involve direct fighting, such as for example stealth and escape and concealment. To only talk about these methods would be, say, level 1. The next level would be to pressure test the stealth and escaping abilities by for example setting up live drills where a number of people would be guarding a location as the other practitioners would try to infiltrate it or escape it while the other practitioners would be putting their efforts to not allow it. As I stated before, I was pointing out that Bujinkan is allegedly suffering from quality control issues, that some schools are potentially doing a much better job than others. I was indeed able to find one example of such a school known as Akban. It is a school based in Israel and led by Yossi Serif, a fifth black belt degree Bujinkan expert. The training in Akban seems to be strongly inspired by what is taught in Bujinkan, but the organization does not stop there. They also include other practices such as Judo, BJJ, Muay Thai, and their YouTube channel is packed with pressure testing and alive drilling videos. Personally, I have great admiration for their approach. But Agban was the only Bujinkan related organization that I was able to find which clearly focuses on functionality and pressure testing. Interestingly too, Agban seems to have cut their official ties with Bujin Khan, despite still maintaining a relationship with the organization. This also brought up yet another important question for me. If Agban members are capable of sparring and pressure testing Bujin Khan techniques, isn't that proof that sparring with Bujin Khan techniques is possible? Another pressure testing video I was sent as a contribution. It was a video of a knife sparring session from a combat sports practitioner who also did Bujinkan. He explained to me that he trained Bujinkan in a school that did live drilling. But as far as online presence goes, Bujinkan schools that do pressure testing seems to be far and few in between. They seem to be cases of outliers. And that begs a question. If we entertain the possibility that a martial art should be assessed and judged by its training methodology rather than technique alone, should we really take the cases of outliers as a representation of the practice? Meanwhile, if the majority of schools in a particular style do not pressure test and the organization itself grants the highest ranks to its practitioners without any reference to the training methodology and pressure tested abilities, does that not portray a questionable reputation of the analyzed practice? To be clear, there's nothing wrong in training cool stuff such as sword fighting techniques and fancy martial arts moves which are not pressure tested. It can be a fun and enjoyable hobby and experience. For example, if I were to question the functionality of Kendo for self-defense, probably many people would raise their eyebrows. That's since I've never seen Kendo practitioners promote their practice as effective self-defense. The same goes to many Tai Chi practices. But the situation changes immediately once a practice starts making claims that it's an effective form of fighting or self-defense. That's why it is important that there would be a level of honesty and clarity, that this particular school does not teach functional self-defense, or that the school cannot guarantee the effectiveness of the taught techniques since there's no pressure testing. As soon as a martial arts practice starts to make claims that it is effective for fighting or self-defense, it should be ready to offer proof. And anecdotes are not proof. Just because somebody told a story of how someone applied a technique, it is not proof of efficiency. Proof of efficiency comes through constant testing with repeatable results. A number of people also told me that before I analyze, I should try the practice out personally. 
Well, to tell you the truth, I did experience Bujinkan on a number of occasions. That was back in the day when I was still running my Aikido school and I invited a Bujinkan instructor to teach seminars. I am also already organizing an opportunity for me to participate in a Bujinkan training. Yet that is not always easy to do. After my initial Bujinkan video, a practitioner sent me a message quoting his instructor who said this about me. Talk is cheap. Critical analysis my ass. Just cheap link bait to make people click his page and sell adverts. He's welcome to pop in and feel the pain that goes with a good technique. I told the practitioner that I'm open to taking up his instructor's invitation to come down and experience their training. The practitioner then informed his instructor about my interest. This was his instructor's response. Amusing, but he is never coming unless he can manipulate it for his gain and our loss. I then said that I'm willing to come respectfully. But the interest from the instructor to have me come over seems to have disappeared. Still, whether trying e-martial art out directly or not, I believe we can assess a practice based on what we see, and we can question its training methodology. And if no proof is offered that validates its claims, we have the right to be suspicious. If you're interested to learn how I experienced no-touch martial arts and what that led me to discover, click on this video right here. Thank you for watching, and as always, I wish you to own your journey.